All right, guys, let's get started. Thanks for coming back. Uh, just to remind, this is the entrepreneurship track. The other one is the leadership track. Uh, we'll go through two panels. The first one is, is being a good engineer enough? And uh, all of us know, if you went to IIT, chances are either you are a good engineer or you're Varun. So <laughs> I, I'm, I'm in marketing. I don't, know, don't do engineering. I went to school four years, IIT Guwahati, two years, uh, UC Riverside, master's in computer science wrote code for one year, maybe less than a year, and then switched to marketing, exactly like Rishi. And till date, my wife asked me, six years to learn how to code, and less than a year coding? I said, yeah, that was quick. I realized, not made for it. <laughs> the panel that we have today is being run by, moderated by Ramnik Basin. My wife's last name is also Basin, so that makes you my brother-in-law, kind of. <laughs> 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 I was being respectful. <laughs> that was not rehearsed, by the way. <laughs> no. Oh, none of this is rehearsed. I had no idea I was doing this. <laughs> Ramnik is a seasoned exec with deep experience in both Fortune 100 companies and in co-founding startups. He brings a global entrepreneurial perspective, including consumer, mobile, and wireless. On-demand on services, web enterprise software, both B2B and B2C, and social media. Ramnik is co-founder and president of Next Force Technology, building an on-demand marketplace for businesses focused on large and critical area that is untapped. Most recently, he was the GM for mobile and head of product management at thefind.com, which was acquired by Facebook in 2015. Prior to that, Ramnik was the founder and CEO of Mobio Networks, building the next gen of mobile platforms Consumer and consumer wireless services. He was the co-founder and CEO of Vialto Corporation, which was acquired by Cisco in 2004. Prior to that, he held several executive and technical roles at companies such as Schlumberger, Digital Equipment, and Synercom Technologies. He has masters from Louisiana State and a BTEC from IIT Kanpur. Let's welcome Ramnik and the panel. Thank you. And where's Sudeep? Sudeep there. All right. So Sudeep, either, either people are going to thank you, or at the end of the day, you'll be running from here. <laughs> well, thanks, everyone, for being here, and not at the other panel. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm going to start with a quick raise of hands so that my panelists know uh, what they're dealing with, how, how rough this audience is going to get. <laughs> So, and, and everybody make sure your shoes are tied, no throwing of shoes, tomatoes are okay. <laughs> All right, uh, show of hands, how many of you are still in technology? All right. How many of you have, again, it'll be a small show hopefully, uh, how many of you have tra transitioned to the business side of things? Okay. How many of you are founders in a company? or co-founders or founders in the company. Oh, pretty nice. Uh, and how many of you here are from the graduating batch of 1995 and beyond? 1995 to 2015. Very nice. All right, so now you guys know what you're dealing with. All right, it's, it's a community of peers. So we figured we wouldn't do the traditional chronological summary of everybody's background. Mine was enough and I hated that. So we, we'll start with a quick summary of my background. <laughs> I, graduated <laughs> in, <laughs> I graduated in 81, did my master's, did, uh, did probably three months worth of coding, and then since 1985, I've been on the dark side, which is the business side. Okay, that's my background. I've done four companies, this is my fifth one, uh, and all four of them I did on the business side. And the fifth one, of course, I'm doing on the business side. So that's my short bio. And I'll turn it over to Rohit, for, uh, sorry, Rishi first uh, to kind of give us his background. Um, I'll keep it short, guys. So graduated in 99, computer science, uh, master's from USC, computer science. I still code, sorry. Uh, IIT Delhi, uh, 99, uh, graduated in 99, computer science, master's from uh, University of Southern California, Los Angeles, computer science. Still code. So when Varun said uh, marketing like Rishi, and I think this is, this is one of the things we'll touch upon is, I think to me, 
the topic is blind sides of a technical co-founder. I think that is a core strength. So don't let go of coding, or at least touches of coding, and we'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. So, good one, Mohit. Um, my name is <clears throat> sorry. My name is Mohit Aran. Uh, graduated in 1995, uh, CS, ID Delhi. Uh, after that, I did my PhD from Rice University uh, in 2000. Uh, other notable um, steps in my career are I spent five years in Google, um, building the Google file system. I was the founder of Nutanix, uh, and then I'm now the founder and CEO of uh, Kuhizri. That's my background. So I've been pretty much in storage for the last 15 years. Kumar? Hi. Um, I think I'm a last minute replacement to somebody who dropped out, probably. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you were a better business person turned from technology. <laughs> But, but anyway. the, other, the other one was, by the way, you replaced a VC, so take pride in that. Okay, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's at least swallowable. All right, so I'm Kumar, Kumar Ganapati. Um, graduated in 1987, IIT Madras, now Chen. So somebody <laughs> said, yeah. It's, it's, the number, it's the number one IIT if you go look at outside. <laughs> But uh, did my PhD in University of Illinois, electrical engineering, uh, worked at Rockwell. Um, then I did two startups. Actually. Both of them turned out to be successful. And the unique thing is I hit uh, market correction cycles in both the startups. So they had very different paths, um, but we managed to pull it out in both of them. So. Excellent. All right, folks. So the way we're going to run this panel is we'll do, uh, we've, I've thought of a few questions. But there's, it's a no holds barred thing. If you can think of a question, be polite, raise your hand. I'll turn to you in, even in the middle. But the last 10, 15 minutes, we will open it up to the audience. Okay? So we're going to follow a particular trend, which will become obvious to you as, as we kind of go along. So I'll start with the very softball questions for these guys. Okay? Uh, and, and each of them can answer it in their own way. Uh, and then I'll start picking on them individually. So in, in whatever order you guys want to pick this up, what was the key turning point that you had that you said, okay, I need to get onto the business side? So I'll, I'll go first, guys. And I think, uh, as I mentioned, we, th there's this distinction in people's mind, which is business side means leaving the technology or product side. I think the key turning point for me, so uh, after I graduated from USC, I joined a reasonably mid-sized company, ONI Systems, then I joined a startup as their second engineer, Solid Core Systems, which was IIT Delhi uh, founder Rosen Sharma's company. And there, somewhere in that path, after building the V1 of the product, I started talking to customers, right? Because the engineer probably knows the product the best, so started to talk to the customers, started to meet them, started to sell them. And I don't know, within that one year of selling, somewhere I was given the title of product manager. I think the key thing was, I still believe the best person who knows the product is the engineer might not, uh, or, or the product manager may not know every bits inside the thing, but you need to be technical enough to even be good at business to know the inside out of the product, what problems it's gonna solve. So I think for me, the turning point was actually solving real customer problem in field with the product which was developed without much customer interaction. So that's, that was the crux when I moved to product management slash business. When did I move to the business side? The answer is I never did. Uh, people who know me know that I'm a, a prolific coder. I still, I'm the CEO, and yet I code. Uh, the right answer really is that when do you broaden up? Um, so so you're, you start your career in IIT learning technical stuff, and probably your first few jobs are going to be technical. The question becomes, uh, when do you go beyond that? right? And that becomes, you know, it can happen at various points in your career, but for me it happened when I started Nutanix. Actually, it happened a little bit in the company before that because I was uh, really interacting. Um, I was in a company called Acid Data Systems, not my company, a company I joined. I was interacting with sales. I was interacting with marketing. I was interacting with product management. So I started learning a little bit about everything. And very frankly, if you want to be a founder, uh, remember, you need one core expertise, right? That's where you individually contribute. And on the rest, you need to know enough so that you can hire good people who do that job, but you need to be the police on top of them. You need to police them. So you need to know enough about that. You need to know enough about marketing so you can judge your marketing guy. You need to know enough about sales so you can judge your sales guy and fire as if, as if he's not performing, right? 
um, but you need to individually contribute in one aspect. That's your value. That's where the respect from your employees come from. My, my core uh, stuff is still technical, so I stay there. Mark? All right. Um, when did I, what's the question? When did I switch? Yeah. Oh, what is, was there, was there, a, a, was there a, an aha moment? Yeah. Or was there not? Like, like in Mohit's case, there was no aha moment, and has still, he still hasn't had the aha moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm still waiting for it. <laughs> well, life gets crystallized, right? When you, when you have running a startup, when you meet a market correction cycle, it's very hard um, to ignore it, okay? You run out of money, you run out of people around you, so you're forced to, forced to change. So hope is not a strategy is what I learned at that yeah. point. Okay? <laughs> so that forces you to change. Um, and you have to learn to broaden out and you, to raise new capital. You have to really be critical on what's working, what's not. How do you kill that's not working as soon as possible and fail, you know, pivot the company as much as I want to do something. It's, it's not what the market is asking. So that, that's uh, in my first company off, you know, when we hit Ma March 2000, NASDAQ was peak and everything was great. Um, we learned that after the fall, this is not going to be the same way. So we, we did a bunch of things and we raised, you know, five, five years worth of funding that allowed us to diversify in terms of what, what we could do. So we were in the telecom space, we built voice over IP switching for a whole bunch of carriers and um, it was go and go. You know, when, when I raised money for it, that, you know, I had a two-hour meeting with two VCs and they wrote me a check. It was sort of surreal. But the, when the market correction happened, you grow up pretty fast. So. Yeah. Cool. So, so I'm going to uh, go back and touch on something that Mohit uh, just said, which is he still codes and, and he's looking for uh, and, and stays technical. Now, how do you kind of avoid, so, and, and you raise an interesting point, Mohit, which is uh, you got to ride herd on people, you got to kind of drive the train or, or ride the train. So there's a, there's a fine line, especially as a technolo technologist slash entrepreneur, between micromanagement and growth and trust on one side and so on. So how do you deal with that? Or how do you kind of view that on, the, on your spectrum? My question for me? Yep. So um, I guess uh, you're really asking how do I manage the people I manage? Hey, you said it. <laughs> <laughs> so what I, what I typically like to do is, I, again, I make an effort to understand enough of that, that aspect. Uh, let's say, let's talk about marketing. Uh, I understand enough of it. Uh, the, then I have a contract with my head of marketing. I need n number of blogs per month. I need n number of tweets per month. I need him to spend this much money, right? That's what I care about. Now within, as long as I get that, I'm happy. These are the basic minimums I need. Then the person can be as creative as he likes and extend marketing to ways in, uh, in which he or she feels appropriate. I get upset when my, my KPIs, when my key performance indicators are not being met. When the person is spending way too, mu too much money, uh, not returning enough, those are the ones that I'm interested in. But then within that, there is enough creativity, uh, and I don't need to micromanage anyone. In fact, uh, if I do that, then I'm not, not able to code, so it's a problem, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so that's really my contract. With every one of my functions, I have a contract. Uh, with my sales guy, he needs to deliver uh, a number of customers and X amount of revenue. How he does that, not my, not my business. But if it's not coming, then I'll go in, and I'll say, okay, where are you hiring? Why are you hiring that person? Then I start becoming a little bit more of a micro manager. And if, he, if that fixes the problem, then I'm again back. If that doesn't fix it, then I change the person. So that's interesting. So sales is easy, it's a bottom line thing. You look at the numbers and you say, yeah, you haven't met your quota. Yeah. But now we have Rishi here, who, who's a marketing, yeah. marketing person. How do you feel about that, Richard? So, so I mean, actually, somebody's on your, on your case, and marketing is not like black or white, right? It's, it's, it's there's shades of gray. And now you have a manager like Mohit breathing down your no, neck. So How do you deal with that? It's actually a good question. So, um, I, know, uh, I actually agree with Mohit completely. So think oh. about it this way. Uh -oh. <laughs> think about it's supposed to be controversial. <laughs> yeah, I know. We're supposed to be controversial. So think of it this way. I think it's very interesting that marketing, traditionally, it's supposed to be great. It's like there's a brand value. People associate brand value dollars. But in a startup, I think it's, it's very, very data-driven. To me, I think it's very interesting the the strength of an engineering, what we learned, it's not really technology. We learned technology, but if you look at the definition of engineering, it's design and build. And I think that strength, you go across every function. This is my first year of doing marketing. I did product managers this year, let's do marketing. And the point is design and build. What does that mean? It's like, okay, 
I have certain things that we need to do. The product is not ready, right? But I need to still create the buzz, and I need to create the buzz in a way that we get feedback from the early customers. Interesting marketing problem. How do you solve that? You need to control the number of people who get the product, but still create the buzz. Look around, copy. That's what we did, right? And I was like, you have building blocks. Okay, where have we done this in other marketing areas? Okay, Gmail did this whole reference marketing. Why don't people apply it in enterprise? I don't know. It's a fantastic way to apply it to launch your one of products. I think my point is metrics driven and goal oriented is an approach that I think can work in every function, including HR, which is considered to be soft. And if startups don't run with that, there is a problem in every function. Excellent. So the key learning here is, especially for us as engineers and technologists, we are analytical and metric driven. So you can leverage that is what, what I'm hearing you say. <clears throat> let, me, let me turn to Kumar for a second. So as you hear about these different functions uh, in a company, right, whether it's sales or marketing uh, or product and so on, uh, and you as a technology oriented leader, how do you balance uh, your time, right? So Mohit is very clear. He wants to code. He'll do everything in his power to delegate till he starts coding again. Uh, is there a different method that you use? Yeah, I try to hire better people to do that generally. So, <laughs> uh, but uh, I think it comes down to management by objectives. Essentially, you know, as a founder of the company, you have to be willing and able to do all of these functions at various points in the life cycle of the company. Okay. You are you're going to have to market. You're going to have to sell. You're going to have to manage the finances. You're going to have to hire. So you spend a lot of time cross-functional, cross-gap uh, matching and figuring out where the weakness is and trying to constantly plug them, right? So it comes down to hiring the right people always. Most of my mistakes in my startups are um, either hiring the wrong person, which is hiring the right people is easy to say, but it's hard to implement. But the thing you could do is if the empty chair is better than the wrong chair, okay? That's what I would tell people. So. No one is indispensable. You're going to have to take action, and that corrects the course of the company very, very quickly. So that's, that's the biggest learning for me. But overall, how I manage is through objectives. This is Silicon Valley. You know, um, you're going to have to influence people. They're going to have to buy into this. They have options, and it's, uh, it's a long game. So. Good. All right. So we'll, we'll uh, change the tenure a little bit here, uh, especially for the people aspiring uh, to kind of get into putting a company together or in the early stages of uh, putting a company together. The, the question for the panelists is, when, and, and a lot of people approach them for mentoring and so on. And a lot of people approach the panelists with ideas uh, that may be product ideas, some of them might be feature ideas, some of them might be real businesses. So as you mentor people, uh, and, and it's open to all three of you, uh, what are the guidance, what is the guidance you're going to give people as they bring out their ideas, and especially if they're technology motivated people? Okay, I'll take it, guys. So I think the other way to think is, is the idea a product or a feature or a company? And I think there are three different things. I've, in my career, added features to products. <coughs> I've launched new products inside of a big company, and recently I happened to be part of the launching a company. The, the distinction, I think, is uh, are you solving a problem where the pain point for the end user or the customer is high? Uh, at the end of the day, I think, whether it's enterprise or consumer, it's like, will the user use your product enough? And if they use it enough, then they will be willing to pay and the rest of the things uh, follow through. And I think uh, it, it is a very hard thing. I mean, I've made mistakes which is like, here is an idea. Is this going to solve a big pain or not? And the only way, at least in my experience, to get that right is talk to a lot of people, and then at some point of time, you've got to trust your gut and execute. And there's, there's like, there's very few ways. There's all this stuff about product market fit and the lean stack and figuring out all of this. So the, the good thing there is you got to measure as you go along, develop that thing. But uh, just like you talk to enough people, you hypothesize. You need to go into a good space. I think the one thing I will say is, is um, people say is there's market risk, there's execution risk. Don't go to a market which you think will happen. If it's going to happen in next year, then go there. I have uh, been part of it, just like, this thing will happen in five years from now, and I want to be at the right time at the right place, so I'll build something. 
who knows what happens in five years. So the only thing is avoid market risk when you're looking at a product idea. Um, I'm gonna also agree with him uh, that a lot of times when people come to me with ideas, more often than not, they tend to be um, features in a company and not a company by itself. And you know, there are terms thrown around like product market fit and this and that, but let me ask the audience, uh, can someone tell me what a product market fit is? Can someone define it for me? Any show of hands? Oh, come on, guys. I mean, that's the stuff that uh, a lot of people talk about. Go ahead. Yeah. It may, but you may not actually build a business on that. There's someone on the back. Okay, uh, that comes closer, but not quite. Let me let me say in my mind what the product market fit is. When an average sales guy is able to sell the product to an average customer without involving uh, engineering and product management and all the heavyweights in headquarters that's a product market fit, right? And so by definition, you're not gonna get a product market fit when you start a company, you don't know. So stop worrying about the product market fit at the very onset of the company. I mean, the company has started um, in a slightly different fashion. What I would uh, prefer that people do is they should look at trends. Look at all the companies that VCs have funded in that particular area, uh, maybe the, over the last three years. Um, and then question why did this particular idea get funded? Where is this headed? Because VCs are also trying to do some judgment on where the market is going. And when you look at that, you'll probably find some gaps. And then those are the gaps that you should evaluate whether you can do a company on, right? And then you apply a bunch of filters to it, and I can go into that later on in this session, or someone can email me if they like. Uh, you apply a bunch of filters, and then you get a uh, if, if you're doing a good job at applying those filters, you get a fairly good idea that this might eventually hit a product market fit. There's no way to tell up front. Even when it's a good idea, even when you have a good product, even then you may not have a product market fit. My company right now is, still does not have a product market fit because we are still refining the product. Uh, I still have to go put myself in the front of customers to make the sale happen. Right? or some of my uh, uh, top engineers have to go. That's not a product market fit. A product market is, fit is when I hire an average sales guy, and then he goes to an average customer, and he's able to make the sale without involving me. That's a product market fit. Now I can hire uh, you know, salespeople over and over again and make this process repeatable. Repeatable is the key. Repeatability is uh, what you want to aim for. That's a product market fit. Cool. Kumar, you have any insights on <coughs> So I think cool. I've... I would say it depends on the person. There are two ways of building companies. Um, I look at what I call white spaces in general. So ch things that are market risk is usually okay to take. You can get big companies, um, provided you have a clear understanding of how to pivot and how to really understand the customer signals. Or you can take a known market, get a superb team, and go disrupt it. And there are different strokes for different entrepreneurs. There's no single script that works. There are great companies built in, the, in Silicon Valley and everywhere else in the world based on what your strengths are. So essentially I try to really understand and tell them where, where are their strengths, where in my experience filter they're gonna run into issues. Um, if you're going up against, uh, for instance, Google in the consumer space, the chances of success are pretty unlikely. So, but it doesn't mean you can't do it. You just have to think through the, the, the higher, there's a higher barrier to entry and may require a lot more capital and they have to have other partnerships in place or whatever it may be. So. It depends, you have to get deeper in these things. Uh, you had a question in the audience here. So along the same lines, how many entrepreneurs come to you with ideas, with killing ideas, and then they can be the business model? Because that's the question I have. Like, how many Yeah, unf it's unfortunate, but most uh, of the people who are first time, uh, they do the company for the first time, they tend to be the kind of people who are just fascinated by the technical aspect of the idea. And they have basically done no business uh, intelligence on that. 
And then I help them kind of go through that, and then they can see that this is not going anywhere. Sometimes they even still pursue it. And then three months later, they come to me and say, Mohit, you were right. Uh, we shouldn't have pursued this. So 80 to 90 percent are kind of in that bucket, uh, especially if they're first time. Now, if they're doing it for the second or third time, uh, they know better, typically. They've, they've been burnt. They know that uh, technology it, uh, by itself is not the only thing that one needs to consider before they do a company. They need to really vet the idea from a business point of view, whether there's a real business behind it. Uh, look, we're all building technical companies, so clearly the technology has to be there. But is there a business behind it? You've got to vet that. Without that, you know, you'll uh, have a lot of pain. Some VC might even fund you. You know, you go to enough VCs, there are enough VCs in the valley, you may fool someone. But there's, it's gonna be a big heart, heartburn off, after that. It's just that the VC probably funded you out of ignorance. Uh, and then he'll himself give you heartburn because you're not able to build a business out of it. So, so do, you do all that planning up front. So the, the, the only thing I'll add is I think, yes, there's a large number of people who come with that. What I encourage people is, uh, in the very first meeting, he says, don't tell me what you're building. Tell me the story. And I think it's, that is, even, f I, I do that myself. It's like, okay, tell the story. Here is my three people, three customers, who have this problem, and this is what they all have in their environment today as other products, and they are still not able to solve it. And how is it gonna get worse in the next two years when I'm actually gonna have a product? So tell that story before, tell me what the idea is. Because I, I think this is one of these things, uh, having built products, building the product is the easiest thing. Building technology is the easiest thing. Selling and getting money for that comes after that, and which is where the whole point was like, getting the whole product. So tell that story, and that'll help you kind of say, is, like, is this a technology feature, or is there a problem big behind it? So I hope that answers, yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> so there was a softball question. Okay. <laughs> There's another question there. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I, I expect a harder one. All right. <laughs> so this question is for uh, both of you guys. Uh, Omar mentioned that one of the hardest things is uh, finding the right people in there. What are your tricks for getting the right people? <laughs> I don't yeah. know. I still, I still have now, now, now we are warming up. All right. <laughs> Can you tell us more about yourself? <laughs> <laughs> no, so I, I'll tell you. I, I'm trying to formalize uh, something <laughs> in my mind, but in a 45 minute discussion, you have to learn to judge whether you want to spend more time or not. And you're gonna make mistakes, that's, that's a fact of life. But you have to have a process by which you catch and eliminate these mistakes over time. And typically these may be your friends, you may have got close to them, they're not able to scale. It's a tough decision to either you know, refocus them onto a different part of the business or you know, reducing their responsibility or even you know, having them go focus somewhere else outside the company. But I, I look at a three-point matrix. Essentially, you know, capability. I mean, everybody knows how to evaluate that usually. It's skill, it's depth, background experience. Um, the passion and fit um, is, I mean, integrity is bottom line, okay? Our, our, the core of it, you cannot, can't have somebody who has uh, insecurities that will be hard for, in, in a startup, there's not enough time in the world. So you're gonna have to take people at face value and, and start building these things. So the passion and fit is very hard to estimate. Um, there are Oftentimes I've found there are people who are very quiet who actually are the best producers in the company. And they interview badly, but they end up amazing me. Often the talkers tend to be the other way around, so I'm still learning. Um, and the fit is, so sort of what I look for is the self-awareness. Uh, typically I look for people who understand the strengths and weaknesses, nobody is perfect. Um, how they, I try to get specific what, what it works in this. It's easy to answer general questions, but you have to get specific and you have to generalize up. So. I, I don't know how to answer you exactly, but hopefully that helps. Okay, here's my attempt. Uh, <laughs> I find it much easier to uh, make accurate calls in an interview on technical people, because you can pretty much ask them a question that they have to answer on the board, right? It's very hard to fake that, right? And you do that a couple of times in four or five interviews, I think you have a pretty good idea that you have a star or not, right? So technical people are much easier. Uh, the non-technical people is a little bit of a problem. Right, because clearly, if you're hiring a sales guy, he cannot do a sale right in front of you. If you're hiring a marketing guy, he cannot tell you right in front of you whether he's good at marketing or not. So in an interview, what I look for is, uh, A, the background has to be good, right? Uh, strong educational pedigree helps. Um, and then on top of that, he's been and he's worked in some good companies. There is a strong traje trajectory of uh, kind of rising star. That's what I look for. Uh, and then just a chemistry match. That's the only thing I look for in the interview. 
the rest I depend on for, for non-technical uh, hires on the reference checks. Uh, and, and remember that people are sometimes good at managing up. So if you get a reference checks from his boss, you'll get a good one. But you get a reference checks from his peers or people that report to the person, that's where the reality comes up. So if I've heard good things about the person from people who report to the guy, and they say good things, uh, that's a very strong message to me. That's a very, very strong message, that there are people willing to follow him. That's the, that's the guy I want, right? Sometimes, you know, the only place where you actually have to uh, kind of not get that effect is when I can't get those reference checks. I cannot can I ask anyone, uh, you know, how he is he? I can only get a limited number of reference checks. That's where I make my mistakes. So I make more mistakes on the business side when I'm unable to get reference checks uh, the way I want them. But if I can, it's a slam dunk. Mm -hmm. Rishi, insights? Yeah, um, I don't have a good answer, honestly, to that. And that was a difficult question. So I'll give it to you. But I think it's a combination. Uh, so reference is very important. So I think from me, from my perspective, engineers, when I hired engineers in past, yes. That's easy to judge. I think that you, you can absolutely sit for a six hour full day. You can figure out a good engineer from not a good engineer. Sales and marketing, I think the past record say something. Uh, one of the things I do is when I look at the background, as Mohit said, is look at the background of the delta that that person generated, not what they did. So for example, somebody can say, I managed a $200 million business. That's no value. If that person says I took a $100 million business to a $200 million business, that says something about that person that he did that in a year, right? So I think, to me, uh, when you look at the background, what have they done, not where they left, and uh, find, try to find that delta. And second is, I think, reference. I, I'm a strong believer uh, in kind of doing reference checks all different ways. Uh, startups hire always from network, which is becoming harder and harder these days. And the third thing, as Mohit called it chemistry, I call it hairdo. And I, I don't even know <laughs> how to verbalize that. It's like, did you have a good time with that person in the hour you spent? And would you like to spend eight hours with that person? Would you see them every day, seven days a week, five days a week, eight hours a day? And I, I call that hairdo is like, this person walked in, had a good hour discussion, I was happy, he was happy, it was not emotionally draining on me. I worked with some really good people who produce a lot and they're emotionally draining on me. And I happened to hire them again, but I, I, like, I would rather not. So I think that's all I would do. All right, Can let's, I add let's a little bit to that? Or, yeah, sure. go. And the only thing I want to say is that uh, be a little bit careful about those deltas. Because sometimes if you're, if, uh, you're in a good company, <laughs> rising tide uh, raises Drinks all boats, right? Yes, you, you got So he may be saying that he uh, took $100 million to $200 million, but it could just be because the company's doing well. Yeah, you know, the hair, hairdo is like, this is discriminatory for bald people like me. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to drill down a little bit more into, uh, in, into this. And so most of us are early stage guys. I'll, I'll, I'll get to you, Manish, in a second. Uh, most of us are early stage guys here. So all you guys are talking at scale. I mean, yes, people aspire here to get to scale. I want to go to the very basics here. When you're choosing a founding team, what, what is it that you're looking for in your co-founders or if someone has approached you to be a co-founder, so I, I want, I want a, uh, an analysis on both sides, whether somebody's approached you or yep. you're approaching someone, what is it you're looking for in the founding team? Well, I'll start. I think uh, for, I have been fortunate. I think this is my first company. Uh, you might have more stories. My first company, so I've been very fortunate to have good co-founders. What I looked for, and it's worked well so far, is complementary skills. And I think that's very important because I, I'm, I'm not good in everything, right? I'm good at few things, and then where is that complementary skill? And I think that's very important because if there's a lot of overlap, some point of time you will run into head banging, right? So complementary skills, and second again, can you spend a lot of time with that person again and have something else in common? For me, it happened to be taste for coffee with the rest of the team members, so we all love coffee, and that's probably working well. But something else, uh, whether it's sports, all of us like swimming or something else, but can you spend enough time and complementary skills? And third is passion. And I think without passion and co-founders, like if this guy is not high energy, walk away. Guy or girl is not high energy, just, just walk away. There's no point because that's the only thing that you're gonna drive in tough times. Those, those three things. So I've made mistakes uh, choosing my co-founders. I've also seen other people make mistakes choosing their co-founders. Uh, so here is what I suggest that people do. 
first of all, the first mistake that I've made in my life when I worked with co-founders was I rushed to incorporate the company. Do not do that, because that ties you together. Now you can't turn back. What I would advise is rent a place and just sit together for a couple of months. You, you still have to uh, you know, flash the idea, right? And you'll, you'll figure out whether you can have coffee with him or you have something in common, whether the guy is actually adding, the guy or girl is actually adding value. You'll figure all this out in a couple of months. So give it at least three months. If you can sit together for three months and you both have mutual respect after that, you probably will continue to have that mutual respect three or four years or five years or 10 years down the line. But if you can't do it for three months, probably that relationship is not going to last. So that's the strong advice I give to people. Don't uh, rush into incorporating companies. Just because the guy is your friend and you feel that you know him from 10 years back or whatever, it gets very different when you're a co-founder relationship. It's uh, more intense than uh, your spouse. <laughs> yes. so, so trust me. Yeah. Mark? Yeah, so in my companies, typically, you know, I, I tend to pick co-founders who are compatible and complementary. Okay, so let me try and expand that. <clears throat> typically, so this is a journey line, right? The hardest part in the journey when things are very difficult, how do you work together is gonna be the defining thing in the company, okay? It's not when things are going well. Anybody can be a co-founder at that point. Um, when shit hits the fan, who can you trust? Who, yes. how, do they, how do they behave? Is what will define this journey. And I tend to choose people who have a deep trusted relationship. So I don't pick them easily. Skills we can learn, but the core, um, core part of how you deal with adversity hard to learn for an individual. Yeah. So and, and hard to judge while yeah. you're forming so a team. Yeah. That's a high risk and high failure point. So I tend to generally go with people I already know who've gone through the journey with me, maybe you know 10 years ago, five years ago, and I pick them and uh, I try to be very complimentary with them, higher to my weakness. I also look for you know something that's uh, diversity or constructive criticism, okay? So it's easy for everybody to sort of agree with you. The hard part in a company is to respect people who disagree with you in a constructive way, and then build something better, so. You, let, well, yeah. let me add something that, he said something very interesting that I want to add to. Um, you, you know, the, the personality or the integrity of your co-founder is very important. It's possible that the person wants to really do a company with you, so he's all sweet on you, and maybe he even lasts those three months being sweet on you. The way to judge the person is probably if you're doing the company with the person, he has already grow, uh, grown in his career to some point, Look at the way he treats his juniors. Look at the way uh, his reports think about him. Are they a fan of uh, his execution, or do they absolutely hate him? And just because he's sweet on you, do not assume that he will not turn on you one day. Right? That's a great way to judge a co-founder. Yeah. Munish had a question. So the simple secret is, if you want to get good outcomes, companies have to be bought, not sold. Okay. <laughs> it's very simple, I will tell you today. If you, if you it's don't not a cliche, guys. What's that? It's not a cliche. Okay, it's, it's the reality of the world. If you, have, if you don't have optionality, when a buyer approaches you, you don't have any bargaining power at the end of the day. So what I try to look for is an ability for this company. So when we started, we had done flash memory. Um, this was 2006, you know, we bet on the fact that iPhones were gonna come and Flash was gonna be part of the consumer ecosystem and we drafted behind that. We thought we'll go up the stack and build systems, but we realized there was a lot of fundamental components that were missing, so we went down the stack. We made a bunch of mistakes that uh, will take a long time to describe here, but uh, net net, we, we felt comfortable that for us, it's a 50 year flood, I call it, 50 year flash flood. It doesn't happen in the data center for a long time. And that allows you the opportunity. We have a team that can thrive in that. You, know, you may not know the right tree, but if you're in the right forest, you'll find the right tree. Yeah. That's the net net. There's no bigger plan around it. And we build the company constantly, you raise money ahead of when you need it, and um, you start executing. You have, to, you have to be viable as an independent company before somebody approaches you. Otherwise, it, it, it's never built, built to sell. That, that is a fatally flawed model in my mind. 
So, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I think my contention is that if you're uh, starting a company with an exit in mind, I think you're bound to fail. Uh, my, uh, I would prefer that the founders do companies out of passion, and then good things will happen in terms of an exit, whether, whether it's uh, uh, you get bought out or whether it's an IPO that uh, you, know, you cannot predict up front. Uh, whenever uh, opportunity does get put in front of you uh, for someone buying the product or it's an IPO or whatever, it's uh, the fiduciary re responsibility of the board to evaluate that for the benefit of the shareholders. And if they make a judgment, then this is the best they can do for the shareholders, then they should do it. But up front, they, you should not start companies with that in mind. People who run behind money make very little of it. So, uh, people who run behind passion would make lots of money. That's my philosophy. All right, we've got time for two more questions, so let's go to the gentleman here. Fantastic question. Um, anyone else take it? Yeah. Um, longevity of the co-founders. In my experience, they have been together for life of the company in general. Um, but I've gone through cycles where the co-founder had to be resized into a different role. And it's very painful. These are, these are usually your friends, and you've worked with them, and you know them. And you, they're not able to scale to, the, to that role. So making that decision sooner is always, in hindsight, looks better. Okay, so, uh, yes, so, so the resizing happens, especially in a larger larger team. You know, these days, if it's three to five co-founders, then typically you don't find all five of them to be the right role. So what I tend to do these days is try to find what the end state for the co-founders would be up front. So you have an expectation, and for a certain amount of risk you take, you get a higher level of equity, but you have to match to the end state of what the company would be. So good, folks. So that was all the time we had. The panelists will stay around for a few minutes, whether they like it or not. Uh, and, and you can mob them, but we do have to uh, cut the session up. All right, thank you everyone for being here and not in the other room. Thank you.